and um, my ex That's on it. such a scary thought. Scary thought. Police were there. They weren't saying anything. So someone was like, oh, well, police are trained not to say anything because it could make the situation worse. So they have to have someone that's there for negotiations or trained in um, whatever you call it. Not, is it the negotiation? The negotiation? I think it's like crisis, crisis management crisis or whatever. Management. So they're not allowed to say anything, but I'm like, okay, the person came there to jump, obviously. She's already bracing herself to jump. She's clearly going to jump. So even if you were trained not to say anything to de-escalate, when you see her in that position that she's about to jump, shouldn't you guys be like going over the rails at this point trying to help her? Like, I don't I understand. I understand. So I can't. But I guess <laughs> hopefully if we can make this work, because the, the internet is not our friend right now. It's not working. But our guest today is actually working on a project where she can help people deal with what we just mentioned. People that are dealing with anxiety, that are dealing with um, insomnia, which is like on the rise right now. I have several friends Huge. That suffering from Huge. that. A lot of our kids are suffering from that right now. They are. Can't sleep. They can't Cannot sleep. Can't sleep. They're getting up. Their timing is off because their routine is off. And what happens is you don't get enough sleep. And then that affects your mental um, your well, of course, yeah. Your mind hasn't had a chance to rest. So um, her name is Miss Sanaya Canton, and she has started. <clears throat> excuse me. It's actually a page called the Healing Space where people can go in at midnight. And I'll let her tell you more about it. But you go in at midnight basically, and you conference with other people, and you you know you get these things off of your chest. So. Um, oh, that's awesome. I can see you. Hey, Samaya. Hi. Uh, he's stuck in the cough, so we normally go out to the window and clap for the healthcare workers. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are Welcome you? Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> so if you hear people, woo, in the back that, you know, I live in a, um, a gated community, but people yell out their window, they tap their pans. So we all participate at 7 o'clock just thanking our healthcare <laughs> workers. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Big money. laughs> I wouldn't just say all that, but <laughs> anymore. But um, I base I tried to introduce you as best as I could. So uh, okay, it's fine. You, you like to register a doctor too. Yes, <laughs> I got a few titles, as they say. So, tell us how you officially want to be introduced and what it is that you are doing. Um, you can just. Well, you know, Shirley, you, I'm always Sanaya to you, <laughs> but Dr. Canton, that's what most people call me, um, and that's it, nothing, you know. And I, I appreciate you, because that was what we were talking about, right, Emmanuel, <laughs> with, like, this noble narcissist that we're running into. Oh, oh no, yeah. Boy. Well, you know, that's it's not me. such a thing, it's such a thing, and it's especially during like times like these, right? You would expect people to just perform acts out of the kindness of their heart. Yeah. But people are just doing it for this like social clout and it's not, it's not cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's not what we need. Yeah. No, I just real I realized people are um, trying to fill their inner holes, you know, within themselves. They need to be recognized and acknowledge and they think social media is the way to go for me i particularly hate social media but you know to do the work you have to become familiar with it or friends with it as i say unfortunately you do and that that's the part <laughs> like i understand if you have a business you have a product you're trying to you know, promote your stuff, trying to brand yourself that part i get and it's sad but sometimes social media is the fastest and easiest way to do that yeah that don't have anything going on that are trying to pretend that they have something going on by taking a, a major cause or a major plight and you put that all in the hashtags but all I see is selfies of you oh yeah no <laughs> like, right so mm. tell us we, we get a little bit late now, but I want you to talk about this healing space because you invited me to it and I thought that yes so, you know, when the COVID pandemic started, um, you know, of course, I, I'm in education. Um, I have three 
children at home with me. I have six sons, but I have three younger children and three adults. But um, being home with them, I kind of found myself up late at night, at late hours of the night, not able to sleep, very anxious. Um, and then as life started happening and people started um, passing away or getting sick, um, and at some point during the beginning of it, my um, six-year-old got sick and had a really high fever for several days. Um, my husband also got sick, and I had been exposed to two persons at uh, Bank Street where I was taking a class who had been hospitalized for it. Um, oh but, because, but because I had no symptoms, they wouldn't test me. Um, but of course, when you live in an apartment building, you live with a family, you come home, you hope you haven't been exposed or you don't have it. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, all you can do is hope for the best. And so um, I, I just realized my time was going out. And so I would talk to some of my girlfriends late at night and everybody was up and they was either depressed, um, scared, um, upset. And they just didn't know what to do with themselves. If they were not cooking, they were on Facebook, if they wasn't on Facebook. And, you know, mm. as a spiritual leader and a trauma therapist and educator, I kind of have all these roles. You know, I know the importance of having a space to heal. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that, you know, while we're trying to physically stay healthy, who is dealing with our mental health? Exactly. And, and in the Black community mm. and the Latinx community, you know, mental health is this taboo, you know, that we want to stay taboo, away yeah. from. Um, and I can remember as a child, you know, you go to your aunt's house and you have Uncle Earl in the back room. Mm. Everybody knows something wrong with Uncle Earl, but nobody <laughs> knows what's Uncle Earl. <laughs> and, and he only come out for the holidays, or, right? So, we, you know, that's unfortunately a stigma in our community. And so I created the healing space um, just a space for people to come who are up at night, who can't sleep. And usually if you're in the house and you have children, that, you know, people probably go to bed about 11, 12 o'clock. And sometimes you're walking the halls. Um, and, you know, just created a space for people to talk about what they were feeling, mm -hmm. um, help them process some of those feelings, and then encourage and support them. And so, you know, using spiritual um, tenures um, as well as Christian tenures, and psychotherapy, I kind of created a space for people where we come, I give people about 30 minutes and they share just how their day was going, we laugh. And then either I will share a, maybe I'll teach a lesson, I'll teach on something, um, or I will play a game with them just to get people thinking about themselves. Um, and then before we leave at the end of the night, I always try help people calm themselves down because you know once you start talking and you get mm. all these things out you you now you might even be more anxious because you're now getting the words and the things out um and part of it is having each other support one another because we don't do that well either important because usually whatever has happened over the weekend you're dragging it into your week so on Tuesday um, at 12 midnight and Friday at 12 midnight we kind of come together for an hour hour and a half and people just share and it's just open you know for people to share because during this pandemic a lot is going on yeah. you know every day there's new news um, and people need a space to process that and I think it's called the healing space because you know, being able to talk your issues out and being able to, to move through those things is a healing process. It is. Um, and mm. 
the most and the best healing is going to happen inside of us. It's not outside of us. Um, and even when you look at COVID and how they're dealing with it, they're really relying on people to heal within themselves. And they may be assisting you with different things, but they're, you're relying on your own body to get you through this. Um, and so that space is really just dealing with our mental health and emotional health because um, no one is really dealing with that. And we're just trying to move through it. And what I was finding, wow. I'm still in mourning. I, you know, I lost uh, one of my best friends to this a couple of weeks ago. And what I found myself doing was as I was talking about how I was feeling with my friends, I started feeling like I was talking about it too much. And so I would say, you know what? I'm so sorry. I don't mean to keep going on about this. And they're like, no, no, no. They're like, no, talk. We want to hear you talk. But I felt guilty because a lot of people that I was talking to about him, they didn't know this person. Right. Like mm. text messages that he sent and, you know, um, different videos and things that we had shared. I felt guilty sharing so much because I didn't want to talk people's ear off. Right. I stopped talking about it for like three or four days. And then I'm, I'm single. I live home alone. Mm -hmm. so I'm like going through this whole mourning process. There's no funeral. There's no anything. Right. By myself. And right. so I'm like, let me get the hell out of this house before I end up, you know, Jason Voorhees or Freddy Krueger and start killing people. Okay? Right. <laughs> and, and it's funny you say that because that's the very thing. You know, I've lost several people also. And the fact that you don't have closure, the fact that there is no, that the person dies alone in these situations, that um, you're just relying on healthcare workers to tell you what happened. And you don't really mm. know what happened. You weren't there. So your mind is racing and thinking about all the things that happened or where things went wrong or did they treat him well? Did they suffer? Did they not? And grief is this funny thing that, you know, we often will push down and push away and then it comes up. It springs up at the most inopportune time. And so the healing space is really about allowing people to grieve and just talk about whoever they want to talk about, whatever they're feeling at that moment. And, you know, it may not always be the today you feel like talking about it. It may be a week. You yeah. may hear someone else say something and then it helps you spring up the, the courage to acknowledge the loss. And so for me, it's just something I've done organically. You know, the spirit led me to do it. And I'm just like, we kind of invent the space as we go. Um, and with the hope that, you know, the one thing I tell people, this is a confidential space. Whatever we say here stays here. Originally, I had put it on Facebook because people was like, well, maybe we should go live on Facebook. But as a psychotherapist and the integrity of that, after the second night, you know, people had some heavy things coming up. That's right. Um, and they were saying mm. things. And I felt like, you know what? This needs to be a safe space. And so what I've done is maybe one night or two nights when I get to the part on meditation or as we close out, I will put that part on facebook in case other people want to participate but the space where they really get to talk about what their day was like talk about what they're dealing with talk about their feelings about what they're seeing and happening or just the mere fact that i have to stay in this space and i can't go outside what does that mm. mean you know one of the first things we did the first night we realized and i shared was you know being confined to my home taught me how undisciplined i am Yes. Because, because I know I should not go outside. I know I should wear a mask. I know, but, you know, when me and my husband's going to the store, I'm like, the mask is irritating my nose. So I'm taking the mask off my face. And I'm thinking to myself, like, <laughs> people are dying. I so, you. But realizing, you know, how American I am and undisciplined I am and how those traits of being this free place where I can do what I want, say what I want, go where I want, how that shows up yep. in a crisis, because this is a crisis and people are losing their lives. And it can be your friend today and you tomorrow. And it could just be something as simple as you can't sit in the house. And then I thought about my clients who suffer with anxiety, who may need to go right. out and walk, who may have uh, a bipolar disorder and, 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 they, and they have the antsiness from the medication. So you're telling them to stay in, but their, their body and everything is pushing them to move. Like, what do you do with that? How do you manage that energy? And so it's trying to create a space for people to figure out and talk about 
what it feels like when I can't go outside and I really want to go outside and I'm mad as hell that I can't. Or when I sit and I watch my legal, my uh, elected officials make these crazy decisions that we're all affected by. And so that's what it's about. Just finding healing in that space. Well, my question is, and I'm going to let him in mm. ask, because you know, I <coughs> talk a lot. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with um, people who are either like atheists or don't really have any like set spiritual guidelines governing their lives. Like, do you try to steer them into Christianity or like how? Absolutely not. So I must say to you, one of my closest friends is an atheist. (laughs) She, um, we work work together (laughs) and I love her to death, you know? Um, and I just really believe that all people believe that there is a, a God or a higher power. Um, I, I use some Christian tenures, but I really stay around universal laws. There are certain things that whether you believe, not believe, whatever, that we think govern our lives. And I, I use her example. She's an educator and you know, while she don't pray and all these different things, but she do believe in treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, the golden, you know, these principles, we all have these principles that you can find in any religion. And so for me, I try to not always push one religion or another. I just sometimes use certain um, scriptures or thing as an example, but I try to keep it open because I don't want anyone to feel excluded or anyone to feel like, well, I can't be in this space. I use a lot of psychotherapy tactics in this space because when you're dealing with mental health, you need to have those skills when you're talking about trauma because trauma doesn't have a religion. That's right. Grief, grief does not have mm. a religion. Right. Whether I'm an atheist, whether I'm a Christian, a Muslim, when someone dies and leaves you unexpectedly and you're unable to close, we all have the same feeling. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we try to find the common spaces that we have. And when people ask, you know, um, about my religion, I'm not going to say I'm not. I am a Christian minister. That's who I am. You know, that works for me. But I am also a spiritual seeker. I read about other religions. I, um, you know, I do meditation. You know, at the end of every night, we meditate. We meditate on Deepak Chopra. We meditate on. Oprah, we meditate on Ayala Vincent. We do something called tapping, right? Mm -hmm. To, to, so I'm not married to one thing. I'm just married to whatever is going to work because everybody may need a different vehicle to work. And I don't think there's any harm in that, you know? And so that's how I feel about those things in terms of religion. But I do state what I believe um, because it's going to be in the work. Emmanuel, dealing with um, Emmanuel's high school, right. I teach middle school. So the middle school, <laughs> from my head, they like want to know if there was a guy, why is he letting this happen? And this is that. So we have like the uber Christian kids, the atheist kids, <laughs> uh, Buddhist or Muslim. Or whatever, and it's like, mm-hmm. I'm like, this is too much in one Zoom because we're teaching them via Zoom and my like, right. And they want answers because there are a lot of them now are questioning their spirituality and questioning what they've been taught by their parents. And I said, this is good. I said, you guys have to seek out what works for you. I can't right. tell you what to believe. But like you said, I'm like, you know, we're blaming God on all of these tragedies. I said, how do you know that that was God? Maybe that wasn't God. Maybe that was something else that caused these things or someone else. And then they're like, oh, okay. So a lot of them are... Um, they're researching, so it's actually encouraging them to study and, and you know, find answers for themselves. But I want to know, Emmanuel, are you dealing with this in the high schools, and how are they, like, responding to whatever answers you're giving them? I think that kids, the kids that I'm teaching are very aware of how to separate the, like, religion aspect of what's going on with the more, like, tangible like medical and social aspect of the pandemic, right? Because it's easy to like, like a lot of them do come from very religious backgrounds. So it's easy to say like, oh, well, this was intended to be because God had it out for us. Like maybe this was a part of the plan all along. But my kids, I think are more, they're less inquisitive because a lot of them know the science behind it. They know the science. 
they know the science. Like they're 17, 18 years old. You know what I mean? Like they know to look beyond what perhaps they've been taught at home. And now they're like talking about actual, like the history of pandemics, right? Like I had one kid text me yesterday and he said, you know, this takes about two years to clear up. Like if you look at the Spanish flu in 1918, it didn't just go away in two months, right? Like it took 18 months to clear it out. Mm -hmm. And then he, he was also telling me some like biology. He was like, you know, a virus cannot live in a hundred degree weather. So I know that he's like thinking about, they're making connections. They're thinking about what they learned in their science classes and now applying it to real life, which is really refreshing to see. Cause I, a lot of times I wasn't sure if my kids were making those connections, but they are, they're aware and they're aware. Uh, we were talking so about I, I want to know about the mental, um, so mental illness is all around us. People suffer from mental illness and don't even know it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so curious to know in people that don't, didn't suffer from anxiety before, do you feel like anxiety is emerging within them now? Like, have you, I, have you noticed that I in some think... people? I think um, what we see with anxiety and depression, um, you know, culturally for um, persons of color, I think those issues were there years ago. Maybe we didn't name it that or, you know, because the stigma was so great. You know, I think about my mother who is deceased now, but growing up, I, I, you know, I can see where my mom may have suffered from depression. From depression, yeah. But because she was religious, how she dealt with her depression was through prayer, through meditation, through, 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 through things that even mental health counselors teach their clients how to recenter themselves, how to um, think positive thoughts, um, think about, you know, help them become up with plans and different things. And I think years ago, those things were around. Um, they weren't as prevalent because we may have not called it that name, right? Um, because of the stigma, because the lack of uh, mental health care in our communities, unless people were completely um, out of their equilibrium and had to be placed in a hospital situation, um, we kind of just had either one group or the other. And, yep. You know, either you were, you had these mental health issues and you needed to be institutionalized, or you had people who had some little mm. issues here or there, and we named them. And I think what you see now is because you have two or three generations who are far removed from spiritual um, relationships, whether it be religious institutions or church, you know, people of color don't go to church as much as they used to. Mm. So our coping skills have changed, right? And then I think, wow. I think how, we, how we live now, right? Everything is about popping a pill to make something go away, right? And so the pharmaceutical companies have came up. You know, when we think about mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years ago um, in the black and brown community, we, we didn't, we took, like, we were afraid of medication. Right. You know, we had whole remedies. We had, you know, grandma had every, you got cold, you got this, <laughs> about 80 different things for you to do. So Eat some garlic. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or give you a little cut, taste of whiskey to get your fever down or, you know, whatever right. crazy things they had. But yeah we did not go to doctors as much and we didn't go to pharmacies because back then, you know, going to the hospital sometime that you can go in and not come out because we didn't get great care. And so now that we are in a different time where you have, I feel like two generations who have missed, you know, that information necessarily wasn't passed on. So you have a lot of children who don't even understand those spiritual things, you know, they may be in a church building. They may even, even how we do church is different, right? We're used to go. If you was in need or help, you would go to the church and get the help. Now you better pay them tithes or they're not helping you. Right. Mm. So you have in different environments, right? Depends on where you go. So I think the anxiety that you talk about is also too, because of the way we live, no. right? You know, it's, it's more people, um, we have less outlets, you know, a lot of times we're stuck on social media and we don't really know what computers and all those different things does to the brain and all the, you know, we're learning now, mm -hmm. 
but we've been engaged in these things for a while, which I think causes a lot of the anxiety people feel. Um, and because people don't have a clear way to deal with those feelings, it turns into what we label now as anxiety or depression or, um, you know, and then, and then like another even thing in kids, is, even in kids, like ADHD, like so many right. kids are diagnosed with ADHD. Like it's, it's a hindrance because I feel like a lot of these kids, it's probably just energy that they needed to get out and they don't know how else to do that. So they immediately are labeled. ADHD. Well, you know, I, I've learned in yeah. my years of studying that as human beings, if we cannot name something, we want to get rid of it. So yeah. if something comes and we don't have a place to put it, right? Mm. If we can't put it in a category or a name, the, the first thing we do is it got to go or either we got to dissect it and find a place for it, uh-huh. right? And so I think the whole ADHD, I have six sons, and of my six sons, four of them have been <laughs> given that label. And, right. and looking at my own life as a child, if back in the 70s, I would have had that label. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't really think of it as a disability, as people say, um, because I realize it's just, my it's just a different way that I exist in the world. Brain world. And, uh, and yep. I think what taught me that is my 28 year old who, um, you know, back in the nineties was diagnosed with ADHD really severely was on medication, was had all these issues. And, and me being a young parent was told it was this bad thing. And, and, you know, you're trying to think what kind of life this person would have. And he couldn't sit still and he couldn't organize himself. He, you know, and I, I knew something was wrong because there was some th- things in the way he exists was not fitting in with the way the rest of the world was, but in allowing him space, it took 20 years later for me to see that what, what others labeled as a negative was a positive. Um, and my son is a fashion mm. designer and shows. And so m- when my mom was sick, I had moved in with her to care for her and he lived with her. And one night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I peeked in his room and he was on a sewing machine sewing. He had his computer open, designing a shirt on it. And he was putting rhinestones on a hat all at the same time. And I said, okay, this is the ADHD. (laughs) But but, But at seven... I couldn't see the beauty in that. He was a genius. I couldn't see the beauty in it at 7 or 10 or 15. He was a genius. Sanaya, my teacher, (laughs) let me tell you something. My teachers would drive my parents crazy. They would call home all the time to complain about the fact that I could not sit still or shut up in class. I would blurt out answers. Like, I would call out, and teachers did not know how to deal with me. Right? And then one teacher, I'll never forget her, in the fifth grade, told my parents, she was like, your son has a gift. You know, the fact that he's been labeled ADHD doesn't, like, mean anything. It doesn't define him. His gift is talking and his ability to speak to people. So you should, like, really hone in on that and, you know, and look at me now. Here I am talking to you. Yes, but, you know, that's that's one of the things I do with the parents. You know, I do an activity where I give them a seed. And I said that, you know, Mm. every person gets a seed. We don't get to decide what it is. We just have to make room for it. You might be a rose, but God may have blessed you with an oak tree. And you're not going to be the same. You're not going to grow the same. And can you make room for an oak tree? You know, everybody wants a rose scholar, but you just might have a plumber. (laughs) Right? You just might have a plumber. Who is just a plumber? There's nothing wrong with that. And in the end, the plumber may make more than a rose scholar. But Absolutely. Can, you, can you be willing to let people be who they are? And I, that's what I've done. I've taught my sons that being different is not a bad thing. It's just different. You process the world different. You need different things to exist in the world. And you just have to be conscious of that and figure that out. Um, and when we do that for our kids and for our parents, I think people can live more harmoniously together in trying to figure it out. But, you know, society doesn't make room for that. And I think that's why you have the anxiety and you have so much mental health. Um, Society because, drives you crazy. It's driving people crazy. Right. And then, and then the drugs. And the <laughs> drugs, you know, you know, the drugs and different things. And it's altering people's brains. And, and then you know, you're noticing people have these issues that they may have not had before. And um, so I think it's a lot of things that brings it. But I think because in this country we do mental health so poorly, yeah. 
um, and especially in communities mm -hmm. like ours, um, we suffer longer mm -hmm. and we tend to get worse before yeah. we get better. Before we get better, absolutely. And I think that we only have maybe like five more minutes left, but I think mm -hmm. that the social media is making it even worse because you're seeing all these fake pictures and these fake, you know, everybody seems to be doing amazing and life is great. And then you look at your life and it's like, oh my God, I'm not doing enough. I'm a loser. And then that contributes to the anxiety and the depression and because it's, it's all fake. So it right. makes you feel like you're not enough, right? Fake by yeah, I think, you know, that's what the social, you know, for me, Facebook and those places are great for me in terms of connecting with people I can't see or have, you know, I can still have to, but I realize that it also can become a place that is more detrimental to your humanity because the truth of the matter is we're social beings and the reality is that everything is not always good. Yeah. You know, anything in excess is not good for us. So if you're happy, happy, happy all the time, they usually call that manic. <laughs> someone has to bring mm -hmm. you down or you're too sad all the time so you, you know I think it, and it gives you this false illusion that's not real I just had this argument mm -hmm. I said you can't be happy all the time there's going to be days where you're a little down it's just how quickly you get out of it is what we need to worry about but everything's not going to be rainbows and butterflies all the no. time okay and so this person was like well no you need to constantly be thinking positive and you need to constantly be working on your goals and i said absolutely not no that's not real you need to be sad and <laughs> right emmanuel isn't this what we are yeah there's there's this narrative though that everything needs to be positive and happy and affirmations all the time like you can't think <laughs> negative everything is going to be great and work itself out if you just put your mind to it like all of that is, is great, but I feel like it's very fictitious. It is. And a lot, we have so many people out there preaching that type of like mindset. You know, those types of, that type of, like, it's all about the mindset, right? But it's not mm -hmm. real. It's not no. real. We have to experience different emotions. And, and, the, and the truth of the matter is, bad things are going to happen. They will. But and, if you constantly. And we're going to feel about it. We're going to have feelings about it. And that's okay. But I think people run away from those negative feelings. But I tell people, you don't know what something good mm. feels like until you've felt something bad. That you, you have no measurement. You know, if everything is always good, then how do you even know bad is good? And so, you know, that's the dichotomy of the world we live in, the, the duplicity of this world, that they're going to see positive and negative. Um, and you just have to be okay to feel them and say, you know, if, you, if you're bad, I'm mad. You know, what I think society punishes us for is telling the truth about how we feel. So everybody's living a false illusion. So my last question to you is, uh, if someone finds that they are sad, they're depressed, and they can't really seem to come out of it, they've done the chat rooms, they've done, you know, at what point should someone go and seek professional help to get out of it? I tell people that um, if you have been in a place where you are, and you know, it's about watching yourself. If you have not got up out the bed and washed yourself, if you have not <laughs> two or three days have passed and you have, you, you just can't get out the bed. Yeah. Right? That was to me do, three do, weeks ago. To do your basic functioning. <laughs> the basic things are brushing your teeth and washing yourself. Um, that should be a red flag. If you find mm -hmm. yourself after 30 days, because, you know, everybody's threshold for tolerance of pain and suffering is different. Mm -hmm. But if you find yourself that you cannot do the daily functions and you're just sad, sometimes it's hormones, too. People, mm -hmm. people don't realize your hormones are out of whack, too, that that could bring you down. Mm -hmm. But I recommend, you know, that people seek out some sort of support. You know, as a spiritual leader, one of the reasons I did a degree in social workers because most people will go to their spiritual leader for guidance when they're feeling depressed and things like that. And they don't want to go to a therapist because they feel like I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thought of it. But I tell people sometimes things happen in life and you just mm -hmm. down for a time. And just because you may be suffering with depression now or, you know, depression that may be related to loss or grief mm -hmm. doesn't mean in a year that you're going to suffer with it. And once you go through it, it doesn't mean that that stigma has to stay. Um, but I think that's the part that has to be de demystified, that 
you know, with some things around depression or that, it's not, sometimes it's circumstantial. Mm -hmm. um, and then for some people, it is biological um, and it is a mental health. But people can have mental health and, and, and live healthy, prosperous lives mm -hmm. if they get the right treatment, get the right support. Um, and I think that's where I push. I want people to get what they need to be their best selves. Um, and it's, it's nothing wrong with it. Um, a psychiatrist. And is that a work formula, right? Is that a formula for No, everyone? because everybody's different. You know, what exactly. you may need, I may not. You know, I have four children yep. with ADHD. One child needed medication. The other one didn't. I can give vitamins. You know, so it just depends on what works for you. But it requires you to participate. Most of us do not want to participate. We're waiting for some sort of genie in a bottle to come down, tap on us, and we're going to be all well again. <laughs> or we're going to think our way to good thoughts or positive affirmations. And so that's your mindset. You, 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 you have to participate that, in right. your own wellness and I think in healing. Um, and, and, and I think that's the part that we struggle most with. That the mindfulness is great. The positive affirmation is great. Mm -hmm. But sometimes... You're going to feel bad. There's more. There's more. <laughs> and it's There's okay. more to it. You need to realize your brain is an organ. It's a part of your, it's the most important part of your body. The brain is dead. Nothing else is, is happening. So people need to realize just like your heart is sick, you're, you know, you have diabetes, you have, <laughs> you have to treat your brain as an organ that gets ill and needs sometimes medical intervention. It's funny you say that because a psychiatrist I worked with said to me, um, I was dealing with a young man who had bipolar disorder, and he was saying, there's nothing wrong with me. And he said, you know, Samaya, the brain is a muscle, it's an organ, mm -hmm. and it can get broke. He exactly. said, you go to the monkey bars, you fall, you break your arm, the same way you have to go get a cast and get... You, sometimes people break their brains, right. and, and they need help, and they need medicine. He said, it's no different from having a heart disease or lung disease, your brain may have some sort of sickness that needs help. And there's nothing wrong with getting the help it needs and still living a full life. But it's just us acknowledging that. And I think that's the part that we struggle with the most. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Tina. You're welcome. <laughs> the word, but they're kicking me out. I'm getting beeps that I got to <laughs> Okay. <laughs> So we love having you on. Thank you so yes. much. Where can people find you? Oh, well, they can find me. My email is um, Sanaya C, S A N A Y I C, at yahoo.com. Um, you can find me on Facebook um, under the Healing Space. Um, the website is healingspacenow.com. Um, all one word, and I have a blog, a blog there, so I write things, I put up um, inspirational music, um, sayings, all kinds of different things, just for people to be able to get some sort of guidance um, during these um, pandemic times, because we don't know, they're so uncertain, we don't know what they're, what's happening. Every a Tuesday and Friday, I'm on Zoom. If you go to the website, the, the link is there. You can come on at 12 midnight. We use the for about an hour. Um, most nights we go over to like an hour, 15 minutes. So anyone is welcome. Um, all I ask people to do is... Uh, yes. So it's um, my name, under my name, Sanaya Canton um, on Twitter. Um, and... All the links are on the web page, and you're welcome to participate. Um, we, we do it at 12 midnight because that's when people are up. <laughs> I oh, figure I mean. people need <laughs> if, if you're up and you need some positive energy and good conversation, come on down, a, right? In a space just to unload, you know, without any judgment, we're here. So, thank you guys. I appreciate thank you for uh, being on. Yes, you're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Shirley, we out? We are out. We are actually over our time, so Charles is probably hunting the air right now. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. We will be back next week. And as normal, have a safe week. A good week. Um, Dave. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs> God bless my haters, God bless they call, God bless these haters, cause God only knows that.